Hey, everyone. Welcome back to Answering Legal's Everything Except the Law podcast. As always, I am your host, Nick Worker. If this is your first time tuning in, this is the podcast where we share expert advice on all the parts of running a law firm that attorneys weren't exactly trained for back in law school. Now, 2023 was a very exciting year for our podcast. We released 16 new episodes, including our first ever live episode. Our show welcomed top experts from around the legal industry, including Jim Hacking, Tyson Mutrix, Stephanie Everett, Roy Sexton, and Joe Patrice. If you missed out on some of our podcast conversations this year, do not worry. We've got you covered. Coming up, we'll be showcasing some of the top tips shared on everything except the law these past 12 months. We hope you enjoy and stay tuned for new episodes of Everything Except the Law in 2024. I know that you state in your book, it's super important for law firms to create an environment where the employees can be honest and vulnerable. So can you can you sort of cut through that and tell us why that's so important? Yeah, I mean, I, I go back to the data. You know, this isn't just, hey, it sounds fluffy and cool. You know, this isn't like that. This is data-driven team productivity. So for example, Google did a major study of its teams. And I'm talking product teams. So these are teams that actually churn out the software you see every day from Google. And they studied which teams are most effective. And they expected to find things like if you correlate like GPAs and university pedigree and years experience and maybe even personality traits, you'll find this perfect cocktail of a great team. And they correlated all of this with actual effectiveness. So the team actually hitting its goals over the, over the years. It turned out none of those things I listed mattered. The number one thing that predicted the best teams were whether that team had psychological safety, meaning the ability to be vulnerable and trust, psychologically trust that others won't judge me for it. So teams that felt they could do that were the teams that said, hey, here's a better idea. I've got some feedback. I need help. I made a mistake. All those things require a little bit of vulnerability. And in a legal team, you need that same stuff, right? If, the, if a person doesn't know what to do, which is going to happen like every day if you're a junior associate, right? But even as you get more senior, ooh, how do I deal with this tricky client situation? Or it could be management conversations. Hey team, I'm not sure how best to work with you to make sure that our weekend work is sustainable, right? We have to do it a little bit, but how do we work together on this? Like that takes vulnerability from a manager to admit that they're not a perfect manager. At every stage in your career, you need to instill and have that psychological safety and have that trust. If you have it, then you're not just relying on your own intuitions to get better. The whole team will start weighing in and helping you get better. You can leverage the whole team truly to improve in your career. So without that trust, you just go back to self self-preservation, self-protection. So the classic line is, my, it's about micromanagement. Micromanaged teams focus on avoiding errors. Highly productive teams focus on hitting goals. There's a lot of difference there, right? So if all I, if I don't have the trust to make mistakes, all I think is what does the boss want to see? How do I just stay in my lane, do what I'm told to do and get it right? I don't think what's the best thing for this client? What's the best thing for this team? You need trust to unlock all that extra layer of productivity. I do want to ask you, what, what's your biggest piece of advice for our attorney viewers on how to be both successful and healthy while working in the legal profession? That is a very big question. And I often get it in the form of how do I achieve work-life balance? And one of the things that I share is I have never found that work-life balance is a single thing that you do. I find it evolves every day, often multiple times a day. My work-life balance as an attorney on Monday looks very different than it does to next Monday or Monday a year from now. It depends on the situation you're in. And I think it's important to build in that understanding that being flexible is important. I think that's hard for a lot of attorneys. Many attorneys are, as you say, you know, very high achieving, very successful people who have great ideas and think if I just set this path in motion, if I put this process in place, this is how this should continue and this is how this should work for me. If you have kids, that's something that you learn pretty quickly is that you have to be adaptable and flexible with kids. It's, it's similar with your work. And I think understanding that there may be days that you're going to have really long work days, but you also need to then carve out time. You need to put some planning on the calendar. If you're working towards trial for two months straight and you've been away and you're feeling like you haven't given enough time to working out, sleeping, eating right, you need to build back in some time for that when you finish that trial. I think there are also ways that I see successful attorneys carve out time for themselves. Not just saying to clients, I'm not available 
on weekends. I've heard people use that or I'm not available after X hour in the evening. For most attorneys, that's a pretty hard boundary to set because there will be emergencies that will come up. But I think being available, but being reasonable about what that availability looks like. Somebody texts you, I need to talk to you about this brief. Maybe you're at your kid's school play, or maybe you're out with your partner for a walk that's important to talk about something in your personal life. Can you ask if there's a time you can call back later rather than just jumping on the email, jumping on the call that comes in? Is there a way that you can be responsive and responsible for your client work, but also mindful that if you ignore the needs that you have personally, that's going to suffer in your life. The stress is going to be really difficult. I'm also a huge advocate for sleep and exercise. Those are two things that attorneys cut out right away that really come back to backfire on them. And even if that's just taking a walk around the block while you're on a conference call or asking somebody to sit outside and have the meeting rather than just being in the conference room, getting fresh air, getting exposure to that small steps, even when you're in a very tough, very demanding period of work can make a huge difference. I think this is a cool question um, because I see you as a very forward thinker and very on the forefront of, uh, of this idea of doing what you're good at and then delegating other things to people who are good at those yes. things. So if you had the opportunity to communicate with your former self during the first year of running your practice, uh, what advice would you give yourself? Yeah, uh, the, the, the advice I'd give myself is based on uh, a book that's really become uh, my mantra as I've gotten older. It's a book by Derek Sivers, who was a musician who uh, founded CD Baby and then sold it for $10 million, whatever he did. He has a book called Hell Yeah or No. And the question you always have to ask yourself is, is it either a hell yeah? If it's not, it's a no. Hey, do you want to go to our neighbor's wedding next summer? Hell yeah or no? And, you know, I think when you're younger, so to my younger self, I would say you have to say yes more. But as I go grow older, you have to say no more because every yes is a no to other things. If I say yes to covering a case that's not going to make me any money, I'm saying no to a productive afternoon. Right. So but also I would say to my younger self, you think you know, you need to take every case and that's an albatross. You're going to drown with those bad cases. So really keep being selective and, and don't sell yourself short. And in the long run, it'll pay off. I love that advice for younger attorneys who do feel like they need to take every case, um, even if they know that it's, it's a, it's sunk, yep. you know, I think most lawyers are familiar with the concept of, of public relations, obviously. Yeah. Um, but I don't think that, and, and truly I believe this, I don't think many fully understand the value that can come from taking part sure. in PR related activities. So what type of impact have you seen public relations make on the law firms that you've worked with over the years? Yeah, it's helpful. Here's how I explain it when talking to clients. So there's two kind of overarching goals with uh, the kind of marketing mix that you can have. You can have lead generation tactics and then on the, which are tactics that drive a potential lead to your website uh, to convert or phone or whatever it is. Typically nowadays it's over the internet. Um, and they, they go into your funnel and you want your goal is to convert them to a lead. Well, PR is on the brand awareness side of things. So PR is not a lead generating tactic. It, it can be, it certainly can, but that's not typically that's not the goal and that's not the outcome. The outcome is uh, awareness and credibility so that when you are um, driving those leads, when you get a lead, your chance of converting them into a client is much higher um, and much higher for them to even pay attention to your lead generation uh, marketing tactics. So, and for law firms, especially credibility uh, through those brand awareness tactics is kind of often the crucial deciding factor as to whether someone is going to work with a firm. Um, so that's the role PR plays. It's that uh, brand awareness, make one making, making people go, okay, I've heard of this firm before, you know, um, they, they, they seem, or I saw them in the news or when they um, become a lead, they go and do that Google search 
and they find articles about the firm. So that's the role it plays. And it's a pretty important role, again, for law firms that where credibility is such a, you know, an important factor um, for, for buyers of legal services. You know, and I've seen it, I've certainly seen um, coverage directly lead to client, uh, you know, a law firm bringing on new clients. Um, but it's not, I don't ever, I'm, you know, clients comes to me and says they want to drive leads. PR is not your number one tactic. So um, really it's part of the bigger marketing mix um, that, uh, you know, that works together in tandem with that. Um, and then it, you know, it helps lead to other things. You know, um, if, if lawyers want to become uh, well, you know, get speaking engagements, other things like that, being quoted in the media helps a lot. Um, Cause there's just, it's, it's more difficult nowadays for people to kind of, sort through all the crap out there and they use the media to be that uh, verifying um, source to make sure that this this particular lawyer who wants to speak at an event or whatever it is, is legitimate, um, is credible. Um, so that's really kind of how, it, how I explain it. How would you specifically evaluate the job that law schools are doing these days? And are there any areas that you think sh need improvement as it pertains to students becoming lawyers, like coming of age? Yeah, uh, not great. Uh, and I don't necessarily think it's the law school's fault as much as it's the broader regulation of the profession's fault. I'm very, I'm very much uh, against the bar exam as a concept. I think that the bar exam exists almost as cover for bad law school behavior. Uh, we have this exam such that a law school can charge a bunch of money to a student, send them out in the world where they aren't able to practice. We just rely on this test to catch that. I would much rather a world in which regulatory bodies were cracking down on law schools to make sure that everyone who graduates is ready to go immediately. That said, um, part of that getting ready to go immediately is the, you know, the third year of law school is, pretty useless as is. Uh, it could either, some people have called for cutting back the length of law school. I'm kind of on the side of keeping it at three years, but utilizing the third year. I think especially in a world where we might see the, the menial tasks of entry-level lawyers being curtailed, that might be a, an opening for law schools to do a better job of teaching that kind of practical learning. Uh, so far, to the extent anyone ever talks about practical legal education, they tend to be, you know, throw them in a clinic or something like that. Uh, it's very kind of, eh, shrug, they can sign a few papers. I think a more comprehensive vision uh, and one that is less litigation centric because, you know, not every lawyer is going to be a litigator. Uh, what do we do to help train practically the people who are going to be writing wills or negotiating M&A deals and stuff like that. That work is going to have to go somewhere if the law firms stop doing it or replace it with AI. And that's a place where I think law schools could get ahead of the game, but there's not really a good incentive for any one law school to do that because the whole system is set up to not reward them for doing that. Uh, so I have a I have a much more the whole system of how we get from 1L to licensed needs to be reformed. I'm sure that your group, I'm sure through your group, you see a lot of fellow attorneys making some very, I don't know, head scratching or, or like, uh, I don't know, frustrating mistakes. What, what, what's the most common lawyer marketing mistake that you see that just like drives you crazy the most? I want to take this one first, Jim. That's, I think it's, it, I think, I wonder, I wonder if you're going to say the same thing. They stop doing what they started doing. I don't care what the thing is. You, you name the thing, whatever, the, whatever the marketing thing is, they, they stop after a month or two and they just don't, they're like, oh, I didn't get any results. So it doesn't work. And so that is the most frustrating thing um, because like it, it, the, the, the most important thing is consistency and you've got to be consistent about it. So that to me is frustrating. They don't stick through, stick with it. Um, and so I think that's probably one of the biggest mistakes, if not the biggest mistake. 
For me, it's uh, the lack of giving up of control. Lawyers are control freaks and they keep their firms small and they're afraid to grow because they're afraid to let go of controlling every single thing. I talked to a law firm owner once who was still doing basic bookkeeping, even though he had a firm of like seven people. And I mean, like he was doing the bookkeeping. He was drafting the checks to be signed. He was balancing out the, um, you know, client trust account, all that stuff. It just made no sense at all. And it's because people, I think people who are tend to be control freaks tend to become lawyers. And then once they're in charge, they don't have any checks on themselves so that stuff sort of goes into hyperdrive. Then they get stressed. So they say, I got to control more. And so they really hold on tightly. And then if they try to step outside their comfort zone and hire someone and it doesn't work the very first time, then they say, oh, that'll never work. I'm never going to do that again. That's really what drives me crazy. In your book, you say that every time um, you consider niching up, it feels like stepping off of a cliff. So I obviously, it is a very big leap of faith that attorneys have to make in order to you know, turn down a, a significant portion of the market. So what advice do you have for lawyers who are very much so struggling with that decision? I would look at the data first. Break down your cases. Do you have a particular grouping? Are you getting 80% of your cases from bicycle accidents? Maybe that's the nudge that you need to go into bicycle accidents and be a part of that community. And and those charities and, and there's tons of those events. I mean, to maximize your grassroots marketing, where are you, where are you getting your, look at the data. So I think it starts there. I, I, again, I'm, I'm to the mindset that you have all these experiences do a lot of areas of law, get a lot of reps in, get the data, then make a decision, have the data work for you. That's what I did. I, I seven years in, looked at the data, I found that 70% of my revenue was from less than 40% of my clientele, personal injury attorneys. It wasn't as scary when I saw the data in front of me. Before I looked at the data, I'm like, oh, is this the right decision? Oh, no, this is the right decision. That's what I would say. I would say what, wherever you know that you can generate profit and you have a passion for, there's that's the nudge too. You love helping, you know, maybe you do nursing home abuses and you just have this passion, like it's going to come across in your marketing. It's going to, in who you work with. And then there's a, a rising tides type of impact. That's what I would say is I would say, don't rush it. You know, maybe it starts out as a side hustle, a side passion, and then you go all in, but just look at the data before you make those decisions. What do you find are some of the biggest issues with the way that small firms have traditionally run? I mean, I think if we were to break it down, it probably falls into a couple of categories. And maybe the first bucket is that it was really lawyer centric. And, and this was true in our first book. We talk about the idea of what does it mean to shift and be client centered in the old days? Everything was sort of built around the lawyer, right? You came to a law firm, when the lawyer tell, told you and you, the lawyer sat behind a big mahogany desk and the lawyer set the price and the lawyer determined what work needed to be done. I mean, if I came to you and said, I have this problem, there was not a lot of discussion necessarily around our choice as that I would have as the client or consumer around how you might approach my case. You'd be like, I've got you, I'm going to handle it and you'll just get a bill at the end of the month. Good luck. Hope you can pay it. Right. Um, now, the landscape has changed. I can sit, uh, you know, I always talk about like, I can sit in front of my TV, dial up Netflix or whatever I want to watch, use my iPad, order groceries, have them delivered to my door within a few hours. The way we interact with the world has changed and clients now are demanding different things from their law firms as well. Uh, it, it always astonishes me. I s still have a lawyer who our company works with who sends us a paper invoice and wants me to write a check and find a stamp and mail it back to him. And I'm just like, no, not in today's world. Like you have to, you have to put your client first. So when you start putting yourself in your client's shoes, lots of opportunities open up. And by the way, this is all good for business because while you can't necessarily control the outcome of your client's case 
always, you can control their experience. And so providing a better client experience, you may not even get the client the result they wanted, but if they felt great and updated and in control and part of the decision-making process and all these things along the way, they're going to leave you raving reviews and be really excited to refer more work with to you and work with you again. We will be right back after this short ad. I've been utilizing Answering Legal for my firm since 2015. And truth be told, it was a game changer for me. I can be anywhere and I'm getting my phones answered by Answering Legal. A strategic partner, as I call Answering Legal, provides a great reward. What is that reward? It's time. Time for whatever I want to do. As a private practitioner, I would highly recommend Answering Legal to other private practitioners. Now, every call goes answered. One of the one of the common themes here for me when I talk to lawyers is that lawyers and a lot of intelligent people who are high achievers are conditioned not to ask for help because mm. they are the people who are always providing solutions. So when you get into a situation where you run a law firm, you don't know how to do it, your default operation as a lawyer is to bash your head against the wall continuously. So <clears throat> this relates to everything, right? Like how do you mm-hmm. manage a business? How do you hire and manage people? Uh, would you utilize technology to help you? A lot of lawyers don't want to do that because they want to do it themselves. They don't lean on staff. They don't ask questions of their staff. They're not very open to being someone who is asking for questions and seeking assistance. They're usually somebody who's providing assistance to others who are seeking answers. And I think if you spin that on your head a little bit, that allows you to be more intellectually curious and start to discover things about managing your business and managing your life that you haven't discovered before. And and our culture, the legal culture, has led us to this point because a lack of knowledge is a weakness. It can and will be used against you. Yeah, exactly. And w- when you study leaders who are really effective, they're putting smarter people than them around themselves, and they're doing a good job of listening, but not in the law because they feel like if you don't know, saying you don't know is a weakness. Yeah, I've found that same thing to be true. The the truth is, is that lawyers as a population are pretty quick on the uptake, right? They can Mm -hmm. figure a lot of things out and that's why they are successful. The problem is, is that you can figure anything out. You just can't figure everything out (laughs) because (laughs) there's not enough time to be an expert and learn accounting and learn how to do SEO and learn how to be you know, a a business strategist. I mean, there's, and do the law, right? There's just not enough time. And I'm certain that any lawyer out there could learn SEO. Look, it's not, you know, brain surgery, right? Like if you put enough time in it, you can learn it just like almost anything, right? But the question is, is that the best use Mm. of your time? So take, take your 24 hours that you have in a day and just say, you know, if it makes you feel better, just say, look, I could do this. I could do it. I can, I can learn it, but that is just not the best use of my time. I'm going to go to someone who has spent however many years or education or experience or whatever it is that knows this area, just like I would want someone to come to me, right? If they needed intellectual property or, you know, their intellectual property rights protected, or if they wanted, um, you know, whatever it is, if they want a business agreement or if they want to get divorced or, you know, they have a DUI, they want, they want people to come to them as the expert. And so I have often leveraged that to say to lawyers, just as you would want someone to come to you as an expert, it's important to understand that there are other people who they're not smarter than you. It's just that they've decided to spend their time learning and being an expert in a particular area. So, so utilize that as your strategy as a business owner. What are some of the things that lawyers can do to better tend to their own well-being? Well, it's, it's, it's what I was saying before to block time off in your life for the things that contribute to well-being, the, the ABA and its report on well-being identified five spheres, physical, emotional, social, spiritual, and intellectual. I work with a lot of lawyers that don't have any what they call me time. So, for example, I was working with a guy who, who was 
workaholic, you know, working constantly. And some of the things that he said he wanted when he came to coaching were to be more productive so that he could find time to do the thing, some of the things that he wanted. And one of those things was playing the guitar. He hadn't picked up his guitar in years because he was so busy practicing law, being a dad and doing all the things that were required of him to the point where he felt like there was no him left. There were, there were no solitary pursuits. There were no personal passion projects. There was, there was just work and work and work. So I felt a huge, um, I have felt huge pride when he called me for a coaching session and I asked him how the week had gone and he told me that he had been playing the guitar for the first time in years and felt really good about it. And those little things make all the difference in our lives. Spending time with a friend, confiding a problem that you're having in someone who cares, going to a movie, spending the day on the beach, I mean, these are actual goals that clients of mine set for themselves because they've gotten so far into the habit of workaholism that they need little steps to bring them out of it. Just picking up the guitar was like a gateway drug for that client because once he did that, he realized how much he had given up and that it was his agency. He has the power to take his life back. And that's what I would say is, if your firm or your organization doesn't allow for your well-being, take it anyway and find another job. I know that you sort of talked about, you know, how you came from the billable hour and, 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 and you wanted to try something new. But what inspired you to adopt like a subscription based model instead of like a flat fee, let's say? I, I wish I could like remember the aha moment specifically, um, but part of it was what was common for a lot of lawyers who end up using the subscription model, of which there are not a lot of, but of those who use the subscription model, a lot of them had a similar revelation, which was my clients aren't calling me because they're afraid that the clock is going to start ticking. And also, I feel bad if they do call and we, I, they have a quick legal question that I answer in a minute or two, and I don't want to bill them a full... Uh, point one, which is for six minutes. And so like, I'm not, I'm, I'm not capturing that time for these clients. And so I, I should also say that I, even, even though I was working for other law firms um, over the eight, almost eight years that I was working at other firms before starting my own practice, because um, now I've been doing this for about 14 months for my own thing, I was always building a book of business. And so these were not for the insurance clients when I was with the insurance firm. These are for my own personal clients that I had brought into the firm. So I was just trying to think of a way that I can capture that without them being afraid to call me and aligning the incentives. And the subscription model really lent itself to that. So I did what any person does nowadays. This was before, depending on when you're listening to this, this was before chat GPT and generative AI. Had that existed at the time, I might've gone to that and been like, describe all the different models that you could use to build clients. That's not the billable hour and prompt it for that and see what it said. But at the time I Googled it. Google, if, depending on what year you're listening to, Google used to be a company that we would go to to find answers that other people had on the internet. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so I Googled it and I saw that there were some lawyers using it. And so I looked at their websites. Some of them had prices, some of them didn't. Uh, there were maybe only like three or four that I could actually find their websites. And the ABA wrote an article about it, but just one article. This was like 2017 or 2018. Uh, I think it was 2018. And then I just started to look at the subscription model and learn everything I could about it. And just adapted it in my very own way. And as I was talking to those people, because um, I did reach out to some of them since I found their websites, and one of them did speak to me, Kim Bennett, and she ended up being the first guest on my podcast, Law Subscribed, which is all about subscription legal services and other lawyers using it or technologists building for it. And so I figured, well, I'm already talking to these people and doing this research, I might as well make a podcast about it. And the podcast actually came before the law firm because I was originally going to launch the subscription model at the law firm but it's hard to build a practice within a practice. And so I ultimately decided to go off on my own. I know you mentioned AI. Um, are you seeing already or hearing about any law firms that are using AI to assist with like their marketing related tasks? To and what do you to a degree? Um, and I'm going to be a bit of a contrarian here. Um, 
you know, we always joke that law firms love to be uh, first to be second. <laughs> you know, they don't want to be the first to do something. This is one of those instances where I actually think it might serve us well. I mean, we're even seeing in the tech community people coming forward saying, uh, mm, you know, I saw 2000. I know what Hal can do. So I'm like, you know, what do we really hope to achieve with this? And so I have my own cautious interest in what this will be. And I'm enough of a weirdo that when people are too breathlessly enthusiastic and you get those kind of early pundits that are almost shaming, you must know this and it's important. I'm always like, yeah, I don't know that I feel that way yet. And this is going to be a weird analogy. I tried it on LinkedIn and it felt like a landed like a thud. I feel like chat GPT is like Clubhouse was a couple years ago. Everyone was like, Clubhouse is going to kill Facebook. It's going to be the best thing ever. You must be on Clubhouse. Why are you on Clubhouse? And I joined Clubhouse and I'm like, I, I don't want to sit here and listen to people without their bodies going on and on and on and on. While I, you know, I like social media because I can watch Bravo's Below Deck and just kind of surf through things. I don't want to have to listen to this stuff. And it didn't quite take. I don't think it did. I, I, I apparently Sandra Bullock is following me on, on Clubhouse. I got that notification the other day. I don't think it's really the real Sandra Bullock, but I'm going to pretend it is. I hope it is. I, I don't, you know, I don't do anything with Clubhouse. I think Chat GPT obviously has far more, and this is what people don't understand when I say things like this. I see Chat GPT as a powerful tool, much like Google search was 20 years ago. And when we first saw the internet and with their, you know, I mean, there it is disruptive. But I think we need to offer some caution about what we do with it, especially in the legal space. You know, I used to use ghostwriters at my first firm because the attorneys liked that. They didn't want to write. Then every other firm I went to, the word was sacred to them. They don't want someone else writing for them. So I and from an ethical perspective, we got to look at if we're doing content creation through these tools, are they ready for that yet? Are they ready for the nuance that's required? And don't we still need that human element, which is so beautiful in the law, to have the idea that builds on the other idea? Algorithms will be great, but I think we need to be careful about thought leadership in that regard. I do think, and there are tools to do this already, but not as well as I think they could. I think with the social media engagement and that kind of thing, using those tools to have authentic responses when you don't want to respond to everybody on social media would be lovely. I think law firms would benefit from that. It's not legal advice. It's softer. You know, I always loved that Southwest Airlines, before they fell apart, really responded to everybody on social media. I thought that was a great differentiator for them. And that if you said, I'm having a terrible time at Delta, you heard from Southwest. Here's a voucher. That's you hilarious. Know, to me, that's good stuff. And that's where these tools could enable, I think, more of that. But again, I think you have to keep those people behind the scenes. And the attorneys will probably be the first to rush, not to displace themselves, but to displace the overhead of their marketing team and others and said, well, this chat function will do all my marketing for me. No, it, it won't. You still need someone to translate, understand, figure out what your culture is, and then bring those tools in where they make sense. I also think there are different, you know, corporate law, you know, I always have these people come to me and say, don't you want a virtual assistant to pop on your website and answer people's questions? And I'm like, not really, because I lose then the opportunity for them to connect to a human being, which is what I'm selling. But if I'm, you know, uh, a mesothelioma attorney or, uh, you know, you're in a car accident and you want to, you know, maybe. So I think there are different, and I'm not, dis I'm not diminishing those applications. Those are important, but I just think there are different segments of the law that will probably use these tools differently. And I, you know, this is a long ramble to come to the point, I don't understand it myself. So it's probably where some of my agnosticism comes in and I'm showing my age. I'm like, could be really cool, but I'd like the smart people to figure it out really well first before we start throwing it on our website and other places. It, it, it causes me some anxiety from an intellectual property perspective, from an ethical perspective, uh, because the the language we use around law firms has to be has to thread the needle both for our internal audience and our external audience and I don't know that we're quite there yet so in your book you write about how the legal profession is one of the least trusted in modern society which I find interesting um, can you tell us a little bit about why you believe this public perception sort of exists and what lawyers can do to overcome it 
Yeah, I think to a certain extent we are set up for failure. Um, I think and TV, movies is partly to blame for that. Like I said, I touched upon it, LA Law, you know, every case lasted one episode, uh, justice is served. Um, and I think the realities of litigation, the realities of the legal profession aren't always um, explored on TV. It wouldn't make for good TV. You know, when I tell clients how long litigation is going to take, how much it's going to cost, you know, um, look, you may, even though you did nothing wrong, you might want to consider a settlement here because ultimately you'll spend more in legal fees to clear your name. And so I think just the realities of the profession. Um, and I think how the media portrays us often as greedy, filing frivolous lawsuits. I talk about it in the book, the classic example, the McDonald's coffee lawsuit. You know, the media portrayed it, oh, someone spills hot coffee over themselves and they get millions of dollars. That That's crazy. The realities of that case were very different. You know, at the temperature, it was alleged that the temperature the coffee was served, it would cause burns within two to three seconds. And there'd been nearly 800 reports of serious burns in the preceding years. Um, and the person didn't get millions of dollars. It was in 400, I think it's 490,000, 470,000. Um, and she was in hospital for eight days. She had burns over 16% of her body. Her physician testified some of the worst burns he's ever seen. But the media doesn't want to talk about that. It's not headline grabbing. You know, another, there's another like uh, urban legend, someone trips over their toddler and then sues the department store. Um, and it just didn't happen. It was just made up. And so I think, you know, so we're already fighting these, these perceptions. Uh, and also when people come to us, it's often at some of the most stressful times in their lives. They've been sued. They've been in a car accident. They're going through a divorce. A family member's died. They're going through probate. And so the fact they're coming to us in these times I've struggled these times of pressure again. It's almost like sets us sets us up for, for failure. Most of the lawyers I know, they are, you know, hardworking, professional, they care deeply about their clients. But again, I think we're we're fighting this uphill battle, we're fighting this perception of the greedy lawyers who just care about the bottom line. This is something that I haven't talked about in a while, and it's SEO, which I think is like it would used to be a hot topic and now it's not a hot topic. So do lawyers need to be approaching SEO differently than they did a few years ago? And and if you think so, what adjustments should they be making? So SEO is not dead. You know, we hear this all the time, every year, every two years, everybody's like, SEO is dead. It's something else is the new shiny object. But at the end of the day, SEO is just search engine optimization, right? So it's just trying to get your content, your website, whatever it is, that you are doing um, to have the Google bots like you and put you at the top of their search engine. So, you know, over time, fashion changes, right? Things change, um, but every everybody's still wearing clothes, well, hopefully. And so even though the fashions change, everybody is still wearing clothes. So SEO has changed a little bit, in my opinion. Um, especially with the Google rollout. Um, I have it. I think a lot of other people have it as well, where you can have the AI generated little box at the top. But at the end of the day, AI, you know, they're not our robot overlords quite yet. Um, close, but not quite. And um, so they are still pulling their answers from the best content that is at the top of their search engine. So I think that the distinguishers will be and the changes will be that, that everybody's trying to use chat GPT and everything else, all these AI tools to try to get to the top of the search engine. But everybody is doing that, right? So you need to have content on there that is that showcases your expertise, authority, trustworthiness, but is also unique, is clever, is insightful, is um, genuine, is approachable, right? Is all of these things that set you apart. And that is where I think you will shine um, on the search engines and, and people will still find you at the top and the Google bots will promote you in their little box at the top as well. Yeah, and I, I would take a step back and, and ask the question, you know, why SEO? And, and is that really for me? Uh, from a standpoint of a lawyer looking at who his or her target audience is, uh, where business is coming from traditionally, 
what the website's use is. Uh, is it for validation as an expert? Is it for um, recruitment purposes? Is it is it a warehouse to store information about you know the different players on the team? And if you're not really get looking to be at the top of Google and, and or it's too competitive a la- of a landscape, you may want to consider all the other you know dozens of mediums. And maybe don't invest in SEO. It doesn't mean you can't create create great content. Doesn't mean you can't get backlinks and do some of the basic things that are 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 just good practices to have. But I think that there's there's some lawyers where that's going to be the most important thing they need to do is to get people to their website and and, and convert those leads. And others that are in the B two B space or that are in a, in a different area, they're going to look at SEO and go, is that really you know, that, that, you know, the bite that I need to take to market my business effectively. And many would say, no, it's not. That's interesting. I mean, I think that's the reason that the world of marketing is, is so diverse. I mean, my opinion is pretty different than that. I think that, uh, pretty much all your competition is, is working SEO. And so there are different ways to work your SEO for sure. You know, there's some, law firms that do better on social media or they do better with, you know, different formats, um, podcasts or video content or whatever it is. But at the end of the day, people still need to find you on the internet. And if they're not finding you, they're finding your competitors. So uh, I would definitely want them to find you. <laughs> yeah. And again, that's, so. the, that's the important thing of, of diversity and thought. And again, I'm a huge fan of SEO I feel like that if, if there's, you know, 500 attorneys in Chicago ahead of me uh, competing for the same business for me to get in and jump in and spend, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars and hundreds of, you know, to thousands of man hours trying to pump out content to compete with that. There might be other there, are, you know, LinkedIn. Uh, it's not that I won't be found. I'll just be found under my name. I won't be found under certain search results or I just do pay per click and cut, you know, cut the cord that way. So. I think, again, you have to look at the, the situation, the scenario and identify, you know, what, what is it going to take to become number one or on page one or two? And is that really worth, uh, you know, worth the squeeze to get the juice? Jonathan, I'm curious, does your firm use AI um, either internally or, or to assist with marketing activities currently? Not really. Um, I did use AI a little bit to help me with some podcast topics. Um, I'm getting ready to start a podcast. Um, it's gonna be called best of Johnston County and, uh, wanted to get some, some topics and some titles that I could possibly use. So I used it for that. Um, I did use it to rewrite a recruiting ad that I had on wise hire a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I thought it did a nice job, um, taking what I had and making it a little bit better. Um, but other than that, I've not really used it uh, in my practice too much um, yet. Um, and then, of course, I took those podcast ideals and topics and it gave me the I asked for the Ten Commandments of family law, you know, and it gave me Ten Commandments after I gave it a few more. You know, it's all about the prompt writing, um, you know, and then I used that to share, um, you know, with Jim and the people who write the blogs for me with his company. And they're going to use some of those as the topics for the blogs we're going to write um, for our website. So you can, you know, that kind of stuff I've used it for. Um, You know, I've heard the horror stories of people using it for legal research and it's citing cases that didn't exist and, and stuff like that. And so, um, but, but, you know, I've got friends that are using it to do all kinds of things. So, I mean, I think it is, it is, it is, um, it's fascinating. It's cutting edge. I, I do wonder, you know, attorneys have to be very careful about, attorney-client privilege, and, um, you know, I don't know, once it starts working, I don't, I don't understand what you own and what you don't own and whether the rest of the world can see it or not. Um, I'm going to have to have a better understanding of that before I do much more than this sort of tangential stuff I'm doing. But I do know some people that are really using it to do an awful lot of things. I'm curious, Jim, what's what's been your advice for law firms when it comes to, like, using AI for marketing specifically? Our advice is, has kind of been you you don't need to do a whole lot with it. like what Jonathan's doing right now is a great example of like how it can be helpful. Like if a, some of our clients write their own content, they want to know what to write about instead of b- subscribing to a tool like 
Ahrefs or SEMrush or another SEO tool, tools like ChatGPT or other things can be really great for, for generating topics, generating outlines, generating like the building blocks of things are, are great. Also, people like Nick, you're saying people that are not designers, Canva has a built in AI component now. I mean, I think that's where like what we're seeing now is that everything that has previously existed is going to have an AI widget built into it and don't be afraid to leverage it. But as far as like constructing whole things using AI, most people, lawyers or otherwise, just aren't equipped to build those things because they're not engineers or developers by nature. They're like, you know, it's, it's still the same logic that applies. So we haven't been advising more than like, understand what's out there, understand what's going on, understand how this may impact your firm. But as far as what they can do, um, it's, it's small steps, you know, content generation, maybe, maybe social posting, like, you know, Jonathan and I were talking about social media earlier, like can AI help his new social media person develop topics and write some copy that might be catchier than what she can come up with on her own? Probably that would be a good use for it. But to say like, you know, build me this thing that I'm going to really hang my hat on. Like that just takes more engineering than I think anybody has the time to invest in or would be worthy of investment. What are some of the more damaging mistakes that lawyers make when it comes to their in-trial performance in your experience? They rely too much on their PowerPoints. So like, everything's a PowerPoint, which breaks connection because if they're always, if the jury's always looking at the screen or trying to read it, they're not connecting with you. So that's one thing I see a lot of, a lot, uh, they're, they're where they're, they do, they point to the screen, but they're looking at the jury. So then the jury's looking at them. So they're not looking at the screen. So if you want the jury to look at the screen, you have to look at it. So controlling where the jury looks and people really mess up their hands because they don't know what to do with them because they haven't thought about it. And they're nervous. Most people are nervous. Even these experienced lawyers, I was just watching, uh, a trial on court review network today. And it was, you know, it was really rough. The guy's hands are crossed in front of him. He's standing behind the podium. He's reading, he's reading. You no, know, I mean, he's literally reading the parts of the opening. So things like that, just, just kill connection, just kill it. And, you know, the game is all about connection. I mean, and not listening because when jurors are, lawyers are up there doing voir dire so many times, because they're preoccupied with, what's going on or how is this question going to help me or how is this answer help me? Where is it going? And they just, they don't really listen. And so then they don't follow up. And, but these are the most common mistakes and, and they're most just, they're most a result of nervousness. I know it's hard to believe that experienced trial lawyers or some, you know, lawyers get real nervous up there, but they do. So those are the major mistakes.